Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and as always, I'm glad to have you with me today for another discussion of military history. This episode will be a little different than the others, mainly in being shorter and focused on a narrower topic. I intend to produce some shorter pieces like this one and put them out interspersed with the longer episodes I've been making to have more frequent and more varied content to offer to my listeners. So I hope you enjoy these shorter pieces as well. This one will be based on a chapter of a book I've been reading in my spare time lately called The Arsenal of Democracy, The Story of American War Production. This book was written by Donald M. Nelson, one of the principal men of the War Production Board, which administered the conversion and rationalization of American industry for the armaments program. This book is a fascinating account of the transition of the huge American industrial potential from civilian production in a depression-prone peacetime economy into a well-coordinated and efficient machine for producing the sinews of war. We'll be looking at a representative case, that of the well-known Ehrlichon 20mm automatic cannon. The story of how this excellent Swiss weapon was optimized by engineers of the American automotive industry for rapid and economical mass production can stand in for hundreds if not thousands of similar stories. So let's take a look at this aspect of the massive U.S. war production program. The Orlikon 20mm automatic cannon was one of the best in the world, and the form in which it is encountered in the Second World War was a development of a First World War German design, the 20mm Becker cannon, which was used on aircraft and on the ground in an anti-aircraft role. Development of such weapons being prohibited to the Germans by the terms of the Versailles Treaty, the design was sold to a Swiss firm, CMAG, which went bankrupt in 1924. The patents were transferred to the Zurich-based firm of Orlikon, which was named after the suburb of the city in which it was located. This firm continued the development of the basic Becker design through the interwar period. As the 1930s progressed and the world began to rearm, foreign firms acquired licenses for the new Orlikon designs, from which they developed their own forms of the weapon. Some of these were adapted to use as aircraft armament. Some well-known examples of wartime aircraft cannon derived from the Orlikon are the German MGFF, developed by the Ikaria firm, the Japanese Type 99, and the French hispano suiza HS-7 and HS-9. Other variants of the design were specialized for installation on the ground or aboard ship as anti-aircraft weapons. A new version of this form of the weapon was developed by the Swiss in 1938. It's called the Erlikon SS. This is the version of the gun that we will be discussing in this episode. This was extensively used aboard Allied ships. It was the largest weapon which could be aimed and fired by a single man, and also the smallest weapon that fired explosive shells. This made it much more effective against the faster and more formidable aircraft that the ships were not pitted against than weapons firing solid bullets. The Erlikon thus replaced the Browning M2 50 caliber machine gun in the light anti-aircraft role aboard U.S. Navy ships in 1942. Dozens of these weapons, in single, double, triple, and quad mounts, would eventually be carried aboard the larger Allied ships, their numbers multiplying as the war went on. The SS operated on the blowback principle, that is, the explosion of the propellant charge was used not only to launch the projectile down the barrel, but also to push the bolt backwards and operate the firing cycle of the weapon, making the weapon ready to fire the next projectile. Spent cartridges were ejected below the breech. Ammunition supply usually came from a 60 round drum fitted to the top of the gun, but belt-fed variants were also produced to eliminate the need for frequent magazine changes and heavy action. The gun was fired by means of a trigger located in the right hand grip. Aiming was most often done by means of a simple ring and bead sight, though other sights were also used in some applications. The gun was usually manually traversed, though some power-operated mountings were also used. In naval use, the Erlikon was usually fitted with an armored shield. The gunner was normally strapped to the weapon by a waist belt, and pressed his shoulders against the shoulder pieces. At sea, the gun normally had a three-man crew, the gunner, a loader who switched out the drum magazines, and a so-called peace chief who picked out and designated targets. The original SS design weighed about 150 pounds, or 68 kilograms, and had an overall length of 7.25 feet, or 2.21 meters. It had a high rate of fire, 650 rounds per minute. A 400 grain or 26 gram charge of smokeless powder propelled the 2,000 grain or 130 gram projectile at a muzzle velocity of 2,800 feet per second or 850 meters per second. 
This gave the weapon a maximum range against low-flying aircraft of more than 7,000 yards, 6,000 meters. Though it was only really effective much closer in, at about 1,600 yards or 1,500 meters. The Ehrlichon would prove to be one of the soundest and most reliable weapons of its kind. And indeed, variants of the World War II design are still, in the year 2020, in current use around the world and aboard ships of the Royal Navy, though not normally in its original anti-aircraft capacity. The British Empire wanted the weapon for the ships of their Navy and Merchant Marine, which, especially in the first years of the war, were menaced by Axis aircraft. Interwar experience, including the Russian anti-shipping offensive in the Spanish Civil War, it suggested that aircraft had limited ability against ships underway at sea. This proved to be misleading, and as a result, many warships were completed in the late interwar years with inadequate air defense. The many merchantmen, which now needed protection, also required the guns to defend themselves. This meant hundreds, if not thousands, of the weapons were urgently needed. The British had acquired the license to build the Ehrlichon, but their own industrial potential was already hard-pressed and had very little spare capacity to produce the gun in anything like the numbers desired. So, in the autumn of 1940, agents of the British Purchasing Commission, which had been sent to buy arms from the Americans, arrived in the U.S. with plans and patents for the gun, looking for someone to mass-produce it for them. They consulted with officials from the U.S. Navy Bureau of Ordnance, and before long were working with the Hudson Motor Company, which operated the naval arsenal at Centerline, Michigan. By March of the next year, engineers from Pontiac were also called into the arsenal for a series of conferences regarding production of the weapon. The British had provided blueprints and technical drawings, but these were not up to the standards of exactness that were customarily employed in the mass production techniques of the U.S. auto industry. The same thing occurred with other foreign designs, the blueprints of which were offered by the British to American industry, most notably in the case of the Merlin engine. Apparently, British industry operated on more of a handicraft basis, and the Americans considered the blueprints from Rolls-Royce more like guidelines than exact specifications. In the case of the Ehrlichon, the Pontiac engineers decided instead to make their own drawings from scratch, setting up in May 1941 a full-size checking layout of the gun and its mount in a drafting room at the arsenal. In the process of making these investigations, they discovered a number of errors in the drawings provided them by Hudson, came up with a few refinements, shortcuts, and time-saving changes that could be applied to the production process. These were submitted to the Naval Ordnance Inspector in charge of the centerline facility, Commander Foster. He, along with the English Commander Mitchell, in charge of the Ehrlichon production mission for the British Purchasing Commission, and G.A. Chadwick, Chief Engineer of Naval Ordnance in Washington, were favorably impressed by their efforts. In June, the project for a substantial revision of the plans for the gun with a view to mass production was underway at the engineering department of Pontiac, headed by its chief engineer, B.H. Annabelle. All through the summer, Pontiac's men worked out the details of adapting the gun for mass production. By the time of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, 600 men were at work tooling and equipping the plant for immediate quantity production. Subcontracting was also underway, with 50 firms supplying primary parts, 41 making tools and jigs, and another 123 supplying miscellaneous materials and parts. By January 1942, Pontiac had received orders for more than 19,000 Orlicons and was preparing to turn out 1,250 per month. This project was months ahead of the original schedule set in the spring of 1941. In terms of money, Pontiac had originally given the Navy an estimated cost to produce each gun of $8,163, on top of which they would be given a fee of $562. When the contracts for production were actually made later in the year, the company accepted it on the basis of production costs of $7,000 per gun, with a fee of $490. Actual cost to produce the weapon, due to the improvements and refinements of technique developed over the summer, had fallen to $6,337 in October of 1941. By the time production actually began in January 1942, this had dropped further to $5,535. Here are a few examples of the kind of changes made to the original Ehrlichon design that made the weapon easier and cheaper to manufacture, as well as reducing the amount of scarce resources required to produce it. The half dozen examples given here by no means exhaust the list, but they give a good idea of the thinking behind this portion of the war production effort. Shoulder rest and hand grip. These were separate parts in the original design. These were replaced by a simpler one-piece design. 
The original setup had only been adjustable over a small range of height, making the gun awkward to use for gunners who had larger builds. The new rest and grip piece could be adjusted in width as well as in height, and be comfortably used by gunners of all sizes, decreasing gunner fatigue and increasing accuracy with the weapon. It also allowed left eye sighting, which was prevented by the shoulder rest of the original two-piece design. Not only was the new rest more practical and easier to use, it was simpler to manufacture, it resulted in a reduction in cost per gun of $40. Fixed height pedestal. This was not a problem with the weapon itself, but with the mount on which it was intended to be used. This was a relatively complicated mechanism, and it proved to be impossible for the companies to which orders had been given to produce in quantities sufficient to match the expanded gun production. Some solutions were explored by the Navy and engineers from Pontiac. One very promising solution was a hydraulically operated design patterned after the pedal-operated mechanism used in barber's chairs. This mount would give the gun a wider firing arc than the original, it's more stable at the ends of its travel, and could be raised and lowered faster, even in sub-zero temperatures. It was also estimated to cost $300 less to produce than the original Swiss design. However, a simpler solution was applied to mounting most of the Orlicons. This was a simple post-type pedestal of fixed height, and was designed and produced at the Pontiac Experimental Machine Shop. The design was quickly approved and put into large-scale production thus eliminating a possible industrial bottleneck before it could become serious and result in the production of large numbers of automatic cannon that would remain useless for lack of means to mount them onto the machines of war. The firing hammer axle bolt. This was a very simple change which can stand in for many similar tiny improvements which combined to result in a substantial savings of time, materials, labor, and money. As originally specified, the head of this bolt had a complicated shape, which in addition was slotted though the slot served no purpose. A bolt with a simple conical head was used instead. This new bolt was functionally identical and could be produced entirely on one machine. Substitution reduced the number of machine operations needed to produce the gun by two and cost 81 cents less to manufacture. The gun barrel spring casing. This was the part of the cannon which housed the barrel recoil springs. The original part was machined from an alloy steel casting that weighed 56 pounds. When finished, the part weighed 6 pounds, meaning that 50 pounds of specialty steel were converted into scrap in the manufacture of this part alone. Taking their example from automotive manufacture processes, a substitute part was designed using a forged base to which a tubular extension was welded. This new part, which also weighed 6 pounds when finished, was tested and found satisfactory. As a result of its substitution for the original, 42 pounds of expensive, hard-to-produce steel alloy were saved, several intensive drilling operations eliminated, and another part, a bushing, is no longer needed. The resulting changes meant that three man hours were saved and six fewer machines needed in the manufacturing process of this part. The production cost per gun was lowered again, this time by $20. Trigger cover plate. This part was originally made from a steel forging. In other words, a solid block of steel weighing 5.37 pounds that would then be machined into the required shape. This required several operations, after which the surfaces would all have to be finished. This was a time-consuming procedure. The redesign allowed the cover plate instead to be created from two stamped steel pieces which were then riveted together, resulting in a plate weighing 3.37 pounds before finishing. This resulted in a part which was just as serviceable and weighed 2 pounds less. The number of machines needed to produce the part was reduced from 12 to 8, the number of individual operations from 29 to 15. The resulting part could be produced more quickly and save the creation of two pounds of steel scrap in the process. Savings of money was also substantial, as the cost to produce the new plate fell from $25.67 to $7.16, savings of 72%, further lowering the production cost of the gun by $18.51 on this part alone. And the hand cocking device. The Orlicon, like most other firearms, required cocking before it would be ready to fire. This involved pulling the barrel back against the recoil springs and locking it into place, difficult operation on such a large gun. This could be done by attaching the barrel to the mount with a lanyard and elevating the weapon, but it was more common for the procedure to be carried out by three men pulling on a rope attached to the barrel, a device consisting of brackets around which a rope would be wound, resulting in a multiple block and tackle arrangement, was developed. By means of this device, 
The gunner could cock the weapon unaided by pulling back on the loose end of the rope, the brackets and rope giving him an effective 9 to 1 mechanical advantage. In addition to making the readying of the Orlicon a one-man job, the hand cocking device was very useful in case of a jam. Often, the tension in the barrel springs needed to be released to enable the gunner to clear the jam, and he could do this quickly himself by pulling back on the same rope to lock the barrel. This simple device thus removed the liability of the original design. A man slipping or losing his grip during the original rope pulling procedure while attempting to clear a jam would result in the gun snapping back to firing position with the jammed round still in the way, possibly leading to an explosion in the barrel. These refinements are just the tip of the iceberg. The major components of the gun, including the recoil system and the breech casing, were also extensively simplified. In the case of these latter two components, this entailed what was practically a complete redesign of the weapon. As was the case with the minor changes outlined above, these changes resulted in a simpler weapon with the same excellent firing characteristics as the original Swiss design. The resulting weapon was easier and quicker to manufacture, and required fewer resources in the form of time, raw materials, machine tools, and money. Tens of thousands of these weapons would pour from American assembly lines, facilitated by improvements such as we've seen here. And so that is where I will end this episode. I hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting or useful. If you're so inclined, you can let me know what you think of this shorter format on my Twitter, where I am at Record of Arms. I've had a great time making this podcast over the course of the last year, and I really appreciate all of you who have chosen to listen and show me your interest and support. It means a lot to me to have a means of communicating my interest in these topics with others with similar predilections, and I find it incredible that this feeble effort of mine has found an audience all over the world, so thanks again. I'd like to take the opportunity to wish you all a happy holiday, whatever you may celebrate, and a wonderful end of the year. Let's hope that the next one is not so full of unexpected challenges as this one has been. Next time I talk with you, I'll be continuing my series on the SVD dive bomber with a look at its lesser known use in the European theater, including its role in the first part of the Allied comeback against the Axis, torch landings in North Africa. Till then, I remain Mark Seven, wishing you all the best.